Greetings and Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Greetings to House of Israel London, our Sabbath service. And today's teaching is going to be, Are You Justified by Works? I believe this is a teaching which is going to um, open up some serious um, revelation. I believe it's going to, uh, it's going to bless and equip um, many people in terms of justification by faith built on the teachings of Yeshua and justification by works built uh, and, and predominantly predicated by the Apostle um, James so that is what we're going to um, endeavor to look into today as usual we invite you all to join us every Saturday at Lascar Wharf Community Centre, 19 Parnham Street, London E14 7PZ. We are here at 1pm and every single um, Sabbath we come together to hear the word, we fellowship and we break bread as per instructed in the Holy Convocations of Jehovah. So if you want to join us you can always get in touch there's a facility to do that on our website. There is also an email that you can reach us at, which is hoilondon at yahoo.co.uk. Now, for whatever reason you may have to send us some mail, it could be um, to send us a letter in a post for your first fruits, tithes, and offerings. You can also um, reach us at House of Israel London, P.O. Box 732. 38 London E14 1RW. So there's various different ways you can um, you can get in touch with us, and all of that will be contained on the website. Our social media outreach consists of a Facebook fan page, which is House of Israel London, which typically we we launch um, and host live teachings, and we submit archive teachings events and so on. So we encourage everyone to, to like that so you, you can get connected with us. We're also on YouTube. We have a channel called House of Israel London TV where we, we, we upload all of our teachings. We've done so from the very beginning in HD for people to share, like and comment on. We're also on Twitter. So we use um, these facilities that, that the internet has made available to us to minister the gospel of the kingdom so the way that people can get involved like right now anyone who is hearing the sound of my voice if you just share press the share button on Facebook or press the retweet button on Twitter or share on YouTube then that broadens the reach of the ministry and it doesn't cost us a penny it just takes the the time it takes you to press the button on your computer or on your smart device. The Beginner's Guide to Biblical Holidays, as many of you know, this is a resource that we've made available to anybody who so desires to understand the foundations of the biblical holidays, the holy days, the feasts of Yehovah. And because we've made it available, we've made it available for free, we encourage people to share it with anyone who, who they believe would like to know um, about, or not even would like to know, um, needs to know um, about the Holy Days. So go on our website, you can download that, we've made that available. And that's important to know now because we're entering into a season of feasts approaching. Now with regards to the feasts, that are approaching, there are a number of days that we have sort of penciled in. Now, if you go onto our website, you'll see those days which are penciled in um, for us to have a convocation. Yom Teruah on sundown on the 2nd of October, Yom Kippur, sundown on the 11th, Sukkot beginning on October 16th, and the reason why I'm a bit tentative in terms of sharing dates and times which we have secured um, for, for um, our feasts 
is because obviously we are a people who are um, compelled to keep the commandments in accordance to the way that they was given. So we need to wait for the sighting of the new moon, which means we could have booked these, because this is not our own venue, we could have booked the venue in advance so we know that they are secure, but we still might to move them a day forward or a day back. So just bear that in mind, and that's why there's some apprehension from me in terms of getting it out there what days um, because we're still waiting on the sighting of the new moon. But I'm expecting um, that on the second, it will be the sighting of the new moon. That's why I've booked it. So if it is that day, you already know we're going to be here um, from 7.30 to have our convocation. At the end of the teaching, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions, make comments, testify, ask for prayer, and have the opportunity to give. And what I've done this week is I've, I've moved things around in terms of the opportunity to, to ask for prayer, to ask questions, to make comments and so forth. And the reason why that is, is because, you know, sometimes I can, I can hold people here for an hour and, and so on. And people feel compelled to remain, and especially online, to remain and, and to, to wait until the, 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 the blessings. So what I'm doing, um, and you'll see this at the end, I'm going to give everyone the opportunity to ask questions. I'm going to give everyone the opportunity to ask for prayer. But what I'm then going to do is I'm going to say the blessing. So anybody who desires to go and you know, go and have some chicken or go and fellowship, they can do so. They won't be compelled if there is a, a testimony or a comment, um, and those online as well, which, is, which, which the person or the individuals desire to express. So we're just changing things um, around, and we're going to see how we go with that. And our vision is to be a worshipping people, an evangelistic community, a discipleship center, an equipping network, and a worldwide witness for Yeshua Messiah. Now, and with that being said, um, in terms of being an equipping network and a discipleship center, next week we are scheduled to have a teaching by one of the um, one of the people, one of the members of our assembly, and all of you here know her, and some of you online may have um, heard her name. Her name is um, Juliet, and she's going to be bringing a a teaching um, from what I've been told on true worshippers. Now, what I'm doing now is I'm preparing the people. Because when, when I'm considering that, you know, there's going to be a, another teacher and that another teacher is a woman, I know um, some people, they might come from places might, which might have a problem. Now, the reality is when you're dealing with people who comes from different places, we need to address issues before they arise. I would just like to remind everyone that there are several women in the Bible who were considered prophets. One of them is Miriam, the sister of Moses. And there's a certain instance in, in the Bible, I believe it's Exodus 15, where she has the attention of the whole congregation of Israel. She's there singing, she's there doing her thing, you know, and they're all, they're all observing what she's saying. Now, certain people, and there's other examples, and I might go over them in a moment, but there's certain people who might, con who might declare that because of a teaching that Paul delivered to Timothy, that a woman is not allowed to speak. But she was a prophetess and she spoke in front of the whole assembly of Israel. 
there is a woman called Deborah who was a judge and she judged the house of Israel in the book of Judges in Judges 4 chapter 4 so if the women are not allowed to speak how is a woman supposed to judge and I'm just bringing our, our attention to some of these things because in this ministry our, our vision is to be true worshippers our vision is to disciple people and teach people the gospel of the kingdom so with that being said we need to when we approach leaven we need to um, put leaven in its rightful place you know and that's in the bin there's also other scenarios we know that Philip had four daughters they were virgins but they were also prophetesses you know and you had um, Aquila and Priscilla who go about teaching Apollos who was a man so when, with that being said I'm, I'm just laying this out because I believe it's necessary and I know that depending on where people come from they might have the view that you know women have a certain place and they need to be under subjection and so on they can't teach but clearly in the Bible is that's not so so can we move on amen good so are you justified by works um, let's begin with some prayer Marcelo your it's just there father in heaven we are grateful for this day a day that you've made and we've come together setting this day aside praying that you'll be a part of this day with us we know that you've said in your word through Yeshua that where two or three people are gathered together in his name there he is in the midst so in his name we invite you into this assembly knowing that there are things which have taken place in the week which right now may be holding our minds captive there are things which may be in us or holding us down which may try and cause us to not focus on being in fellowship with you but we ask that by the leading of your spirit that you that you loose us from every bond that you free us father so we can be the true worship worshipers who worship you in spirit and in truth father we declare that you are sovereign over our lives and over our hearts we declare that you reign in the midst of us so father open up the windows of heaven and speak to us today deliver us today heal us today give us a word of wisdom a word of knowledge whatever is necessary for us to be able to come before you without spot and without blemish father we desire to please you so I'm praying in Yeshua's name that you'll use us father to minister to each other to edify each other and to glorify your name in Yeshua's name we ask that you have your way may the seed of the word be sown into good fruitful ground in Yeshua's name we bless you and thank you amen amen so are you justified by works again this is going I'm, I'm praying I believe there's some things which we're gonna go through today which I've not seen before so I'm praying that it's certainly going to minister to you so when judging oneself we ought so we are not judged the tendency of religiously biased individuals is to presuppose what scriptures to measure oneself against so when you're going through the process of trying to remove the beam in your own eye what people have a tendency to do is only use certain passages of scripture to judge themselves by this is what Paul says to Timothy 
all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that a man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That's Second Timothy chapter 3. Now, the issue that I've encountered, and I'm, I'm sure many of you have encountered the very same thing, is that this scripture or this epistle, this verse, is often cited by people who reject the scriptures. So individuals will say all scripture is good and given by inspiration of God, but these are the very same people, a lot of the time, who reject three quarters of the scripture because it's not good. So passages like these are often highlighted to support doctrines thought to be inspired by epistles, whilst often rejecting the scripture. Paul wrote epistles that taught scripture which were profitable for doctrine. And we looked at that and clarified that last week in the last session. Paul's epistle, Paul's letters taught scripture. And we can see that when he begins to tell the people that the just shall live by faith. Now what people do is they take the epistle and reject the scripture and come up with an, a perverted interpretation, not realizing that he says, for it is written. He's quoting scripture. So Paul wrote epistles that taught scripture, which are profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. A doctrine that teaches epistles and rejects scripture, which are inspired, is not good. It's not good. Not preparing people for perfection unto good works. As a matter of fact, there are many people who don't believe in doing works, period. Because Jesus done them. So there is a a certain hypocrisy that takes place when this passage is used to support a doctrine which rejects the scripture and as a result reject the words all to the works altogether and i'm just going to um, recap some of the things which we went through in the previous teaching romans 1:17 for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written. Now we, what we discovered in the previous teaching is that he's actually quoting. This is why he says, as it is written. The just, the chaos, righteous, observing divine laws. From the root, Dika. 1349, custom, usage, right, just, a suit of law. These people shall live by faith. So when Paul is delivering this teaching to Roman Gentiles, he's teaching the Roman Gentiles the Tanakh, the Old Testament. And then he brings his teaching to another level, Romans 2.13. For the hearers, for not the hearers of the law are just, 1342 before God but the doers of the law shall be justified Dikaio, declared pronounced one to be just righteous or such as he ought to be so the faith that Paul wrote to the Roman Gentiles about that the just should live by is in Yeshua however faith that the just should live by does not render works or the law obsolete. If it did render it obsolete, he would not be saying that it's not the hearers of the law that shall be justified, 
It's the doers of the law that shall be justified. The issue that he's trying to clear up is the difference between the works of people who reject Yeshua and the faith that people have in Yeshua which prepares them unto good works. That's the difference. So the faith that Paul wrote to the Roman Gentiles about that the just should live by is in Yeshua. However, faith that the just should live by does not render the works or law obsolete because not the hearer of the law are just, are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Paul made this point to Timothy that all scripture is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto good works. So when you reject the scripture for a doctrine, supporting it with an, an epistle, you inevitably misunderstand the epistle. As a result, doctrines that reject the scriptures for epistle then begin to discredit epistles. What is being expressed here is that all of these individuals had the same teacher. They had the same teacher. But when you reject the teachings of the teacher, the word made flesh, then you put yourself in a position where you have to dis start discrediting certain epistles because certain epistles doesn't line up with your doctrine. And this is what happens when individuals want to wanna essentially say that John, the, doc, the, the epistle of John is for the Jews. The epistle of James is for the Jews. The epistle of Peter is for the Jews. But Romans and Galatians is for us Christians. That the gospel, everything Jesus did before the cross, everything he taught before the cross was for the Jews. The works that he said you shall do, he's talking to the Jews. Everything after the cross is for the Christians. This is what happens when you reject the base and try and just take the icing. And there is no book which does that or has that impact on individuals and their doctrine than James. James verse, chapter 1 verse 1. James a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad greetings. So now what we can see is that the two favorite books to, to many people who want, who want to teach a justification by faith, making the law and works obsolete is Galatians and Romans. Now, we've gone through the process of identifying the context of those epistles. Galatians is written to the people of Galatia. Romans is written to the people of Rome. James, the epistle James, is written to everybody. If you define yourself to be a believer in Yeshua, you are part of Israel. And he is saying to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, this epistle is not for the Jews. Otherwise, he would say to the Judeans, it's not for the Benjamites. Otherwise, he would say to the Benjamites, it's for the 12 tribes. Amen? Now, the, the issue is, because it's in our Bible, P 
people, when you start studying the book of James and start looking into this kind of stuff, you'll see that people, it doesn't fit with doctrine, so let's spiritualize it. So the church becomes the 12 tribes. You know, it, it, Paul's epistle, widely accepted by the Christian world, was sent to Gentile believers in Rome. James's epistle, a general epistle, that's what it's called, a general epistle. There's no, there's, he's not responding to a particular instance here. It's a general epistle, which has no specific audience, is either rejected or spiritualized. So you have epistles which are sent to certain individuals to, to respond to certain situations. Galatians, you have these Pharisees coming in, talking about you have to be circumcised to be saved, hence the book of Galatians. You have the epistle to the Romans, where he's talking about there's, no, there's neither Jew, there's neither Greek, all are equal. If you don't have the law, you'll be judged by the law without it. If you have the law, by the law you, you shall be judged. This epistle of James is a general epistle, yet it's rejected. James the just, who according to theologians was the brother of Yeshua, he became the leader or a leader of the assembly in Jerusalem. After Yeshua revealed himself as the resurrected Messiah to him. Now, when we look at the teachings of Paul, we can clearly see, and we, we see that clearly in the book of Acts, that Yeshua reveals himself to Paul. What's not necessarily paid too much attention is that James, according to theologians, the brother of Yeshua, Messiah revealed himself to him too. There are accounts where Yeshua's having discussions with his brother. They don't believe him to Messiah. He's Messiah. They're telling him, why, why are you here? If someone who wants to be made known, why are you in secret? Go up to the feast. They're mocking him. But in 1 Corinthians 15, 7, it tells you that Yeshua revealed himself to James. After that, he was seen of James, then all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me also, as one born out of due time. So what we have here is that James, the, brother, the supposed brother of Yeshua, had a direct revelation of Yeshua Messiah by Yeshua, the same as Paul, to the degree that James, when Peter, when Peter had to leave, because they just threw him in prison, he had to leave, he had to scarper, he's saying, I want you to go and tell James and the other apostles. Go and tell James and the other apostles. In the Jerusalem council, there's a situation where people are talking about what to do about these Gentiles. You have Peter talking, and the matter is concluded by James. So this James is a prominent figure in the church, the assembly. So as much as the Apostle Paul's doctrine came by direct revelation from Yeshua and should be read as such, the same can be said about James, the brother of Yeshua, a leader of the Jerusalem church, to the degree that Paul actually confesses this in the book of Galatians. In the book of Galatians, he's saying, you know, I, I spoke to the pillars. I spoke to Cephas, to Peter. I spoke to James. And they added nothing unto me. He's a prominent figure in the assembly, but 
people so easily feel that they can reject his teaching because it doesn't fit with their, with their doctrine. So the brother of Yeshua, a leader of the Jerusalem church who also received his doctrine by direct revelation from Yeshua. He never believed he was Messiah until his dead brother shows up. Now he's hanging out with the apostles, you know. Now, this is something I, w I, want, to, um, I want to show people. James' is ge James's general epistle pretty much is for Israel, the 12 tribes scattered abroad. He receives direct revelation as Yeshua Messiah. He writes this epistle. And what you, what you can see on the screen, and I might just include this in the notes on YouTube, is that James, his epistle is teaching Yeshua. What you can see here, James 1, 2. Joy in the midst of trials. Matthew 5, 10 and Luke 6, 22 to 23. James 1, 4. God's desire and work in us, perfection. Matthew 5, 48. James 1, 5. Asking God for good gifts. Matthew 7, Verse 7, James 1, 17, God is the giver of good gifts. Matthew 7, verse 11, James 1, 19 to 20, command against anger. Matthew 5, 22, James 1, 22 to 23, contrast between hearers and doers. Matthew, 20, Matthew 7, verse 24 to 27, James 1, 26 to 27, religious people whose religion is worthless. Matthew 7, verse 20, 21 to 23. James 2, verse 5. The poor are heirs of the kingdom. Matthew 5, verse 3. And it goes on and on and on. So, just a, 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 a pop quiz. I'm going to throw you on the spot. What is Jesus or Yeshua teaching in Matthew 5, 6 and 7? Without, cheat, without cheating. <laughs> He's, teaching He's teaching Torah, but what's that teaching called? The, the, sermon. the Sermon on the Mount. So, we have an epistle by James, which is in the main, because people don't like what he's saying, is rejected... But what he's teaching, essentially, is the Sermon on the Mount. And this list, this list goes on. So it has been argued that the Sermon on the Mount contains the central tenets of Christianity. That, the ser that this sermon is the revelation of the new covenant. Has anyone heard that before? Yeah, I've... I've, I've when I've been speaking to um, certain people about, you know, the new covenant, Jeremiah 31 and Hebrews 8, um, and they don't believe it, they believe that's for the Jews, then the next question is, well, what is the new covenant? And then it's the Sermon on of the Mount. That's the new covenant. So there are people who believe the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus bringing in this new, this new covenant. So that this sermon is the re revelation of the new covenant based on the moral teachings of Yeshua. So that's like the Christian mindset for a lot of people. However, this sermon is replicated in the epistle of James, the brother of Yeshua, who Messiah revealed himself to and is widely rejected. So the same individuals who will say the Sermon of the Mount is the embodiment of you know, the Christian moral teaching will be the individuals who will say the book of James is not for us because of what he teaches. Yet James is teaching what Yeshua taught on the Sermon of the Mount. It's widely rejected. 
even though he's a leader of the Christian church and his epistle is to Israel, it's to everybody, it's to all believers. When you reject the commands, you reject Yeshua. This is the essence of what's taking place. Yeshua is the one who was there in the beginning. He is the word made flesh. When the Almighty said to Moses, I'm going to send you a prophet, he's going to teach the people everything I was telling them on the Mount of Horeb. He's come to show the people how to live a lifestyle complicit with the word. But people who reject the commandments end up rejecting the very epistle which is teaching the moral teachings of Yeshua. So this rejection is based on a misunderstanding James addresses in the first verse. His exhortation is not to Jews. So despite the fact he says to the 12 tribes scattered abroad, people find a way to come out of receiving that epistle, claiming this is only for Jews. We're not supposed to... Um, has anyone heard that, like clearly heard, we, we don't need to hearken unto, or is it just me, the book of James? That's for the Jews. Maybe it's just me. But the 12 tribes scattered abroad, Israel, which everyone who believes in Yeshua becomes. Maybe I just find crazy people <laughs> and, and, and start ministering to them. And this is where I'm getting it all from. James 1.21. Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. See James now and Paul, again, they have the same teacher. They have the same master. That's why they're saying the same things. They're just approaching the subjects from different angles. Paul is addressing a very specific situation while James is teaching Yeshua from a broader angle and he's spending this chapter to teach in this way. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he is. But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So Paul and James had the same teacher. James had an experience where Yeshua Messiah revealed himself to him, and so did Paul. That's why they're teaching the same gospel, they're teaching the same doctrine. It's men with presupposed ideas who want to impose their religion into what is not there, who manufacture conflict. And again, if you've not been in that situation, then, then you're blessed. But I know for sure, I've been in the situations when you're trying to discuss the word and why it's important to be obedient to the instructions, to the commandments, to the word. And when we go to the book of James to explain this, that's not for us. I'm sticking to Galatians, I'm sticking to Romans and so on. James, the brother of Yeshua, who, like Paul, had a direct revelation of Messiah, he teaches what Yeshua taught and writes it to everyone, writes it to the 12 tribes. When we understand that Yeshua chose these people for a reason, to teach him the word made flesh, then we can begin to comprehend what is being taught and 
not be misled. James chapter 2. Now this is a situation which I'm sure, I'm positive, we would have all encountered. And I'll read it and then I'm positive it will make sense. My brethren, have not the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with, with respect of persons. This is how he opens this sort of phrase of writing. For if, if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool, are ye not partial in yourselves? And are become judges of evil thoughts. Hearken, my beloved brethren, have not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. Do not the rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by which ye are called? If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scriptures, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if you respect to persons, ye commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Yeah, so verse 1 to verse 9 oftentimes gets ignored. It's verse 10 that has the highlighter going through it. You would try to explain to someone that, you know, you're someone who believes in Yeshua Messiah, the gospel of the kingdom, and as a result that impacts on your behavior. You're, be, you're obedient and so on. The book of James is only ever open to chapter 2 verse 10 to, share, to say if you break one, you've broken them all. However, this, this passage has nothing to do with that kind of teaching. It's about having respect of persons. It's about someone, you know, saying that they are a commandment keeping believer in Yeshua who, who breaks the commands. That's what it's about. We went into it last week when it's talking about there's neither Jew, there's neither Greek or Gentile. We shouldn't have respect of persons. He's talking about individuals who's looking at people's clothing looking at their raiment, their apparel, apparel, and respecting the person who is in the gay clothing because he's got some cash money and, you know, demeaning the person without the cash money, the poor person. That's what he's saying. It's got nothing to do with, oh, you need to, if you break one, you break them all when you can't keep them all, because, so therefore, why bother? That's not what he's teaching. It's teaching about respect of persons. The exhortation of James is not to reject the law because you break one, you break them all, but to not be a hypocrite and have respect of persons, which is a violation of the law. So, another example is at the end of every service, or just before the end of every service, you'll find that the bucket goes, you have one bucket going up the left side, another bucket going up the right side, and everyone is commanded to tithe, to support the ministry that is being held on a Sunday. So, you have an individual who is commanding people to observe the commandment to tithe, 
whilst rejecting the commandment to keep the Sabbath day holy. It's not respect of person, but it is certainly hypocrisy. And this is what this is sort of covering here. You can't keep the royal law, do well and have respect of persons. This is how you break one and break them all. There is neither Jew nor Greek or Gentile, rich or poor, black or white. And again, it also says there's neither male nor female. <laughs> Touching back on what we spoke on earlier on. James 2, verse 11. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. See, he explains this thing, it's so straightforward, but if you don't go to the verses before and after, then you can come up with a conclusion, as I've heard many times, that we shouldn't even bother. So speak ye and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. So now this, this law, which is royal, is now called a law of liberty. So how is it that when you say to people you keep the Sabbath, that you're un in bondage? For he shall have judgment without mercy, that have showed no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. What doeth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith, and have not works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto him, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give him not those things which are needful to the body, what doeth it prof profit? This is talking about justification being a matter of the heart, which then proceeds into your thoughts, into your words, which then proceeds into your actions. Now if a man believes himself to be righteous, but bridleth not his tongue, he is deceiving him own, his own self. Now a man who professes himself to be righteous, who speaks righteous things, yet does not do righteousness, his heart is deceiving himself again. Even so, faith, if it have not works, is dead being alone. So James is approaching this situation of faith and essentially saying that faith and works, as we go down, is like the body and the spirit. Now individuals might say, yeah, well, I don't need to do works because I've got the spirit. Failing to realize when they're quoting Romans, that Romans tells you that because you have the spirit, you can fulfill the righteousnesses in the law. Which is why you'll find people who reject Yeshua who don't have the Spirit because the Spirit was sent to teach Yeshua. They struggle to keep the law. They can't keep it. If they could keep it, for example, they would add a blue string to their white strings in accordance to the command. They would not be respecting the Caucasian looking Jew and coming against the African looking Jew in the land of Israel. So the spirit which was sent to cause you to keep the law is how 
you keep the law, they're not mutually exclusive. Is this making, is this making sense? Faith without works is dead. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Yet if the mouth speaks and the works don't follow, then the heart is deceiving the mouth. Justification is a matter of the heart, and if one is to ask, am I justified? One must consider one's faith, which is manifested in works. And we're carrying on. James 2 verse 18. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? So Abraham now, who believed God, and it was attributed him unto righteousness, According to James, a leader of the Christian church, the ecclesia in Jerusalem, he's saying that Abraham was justified by works. Abraham could say all day long, and we can say all day long with our mouth that we believe, but if your mouth and your heart don't, cause you to do things which you say you believe then you don't really believe this is the and that's the similar move that's how Yeshua rolled he believed that's how the apostles rolled they believe to the degree where Satan now because of the level of belief Yeshua had tries to quote Yeshua some scripture about jumping off a building. If you believe like you say you believe, Mr. Jesus, cast yourself off and the angels will catch you. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seeing thou hast how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified, not only by faith. So with this epistle... James, by no stretch of the imagination, is saying that you are not justified by faith. He's addressing an issue and saying that you're not justified by faith alone. Because if you have faith, then you shall do certain things which faithful people do. If Jesus says, these works shall you do if you believe and greater works if you believe him then there's some things that you need to do so James there's no contention between the teaching of James and Paul here no contention at all likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them, them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Faith without works is dead. And just like what he's saying, it's like the body without the spirit. 
Doesn't mean you reject the body, doesn't mean you reject the spirit. It's the body and the spirit working together. What you believe is manifest in your works. If you believe Yeshua, then you shall do as he did. This is what he said. He that believeth on me, the works that I shall do, he do also. And greater works than these shall he do because I go to my Father. This is the teaching of Yeshua. Much of the teaching that we hear is that Jesus, all of the works, somehow he nailed to the cross. So now we don't need to do any works. But he tells the people, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. Yeshua not only measured his words and taught, but he also did. He perfectly kept the law, which is how he remained sinless, providing us an example. If we are to be justified, then we ought to live as he who will be justifying or condemning commanded. commanded. He's the one who will be doing the justifying, the judging, or the condemning. He's given us instructions on how to live so we are to be justified and not condemned. So it's a case of listening to his voice, not the voice of the other people and other voices which are commanding us to essentially not believe what he said. To help with this endeavor, Yeshua revealed himself to Paul and James, who exhorts the saints to live by faith unto good works. That's the exhortation that we're seeing in these epistles. Now, we covered, we covered justification by your words, which really is a matter of the heart. We covered justification by faith, according to the epistle of Paul to the Romans and to the things that Paul wrote. And now we just covered justification by works. Works and faith is the hand in the glove. It's the spirit in the body. You show me your faith without works, I will show you my faith by my works. The just shall live by faith, but the just are the individuals who are not just hearers of the law, but they're doers of the law. And when you're doers of the law, then that's a testament that Father's Spirit, which caused you to keep the law as part of this new covenant arrangement, is residing and abiding within you. So, I hope that um, everybody that blessed you, I hope you, you, you know, it's helping you with your answering of questions, it, you know, and all of the things you can take back and share with, with the people. Maybe I should just give you the number of all the people, the crazy people who's, who keep encountering me and then you can, you can deal with them. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay. So, we have, we're going to cover some questions and some prayer requests. And then we're going to dismiss and if there's any comments or testimonies, we can, we can have that um, at the end. So, is there any questions or comments from anybody here? I'm looking at you because I know that you're a, you got questions all the time. Okay, good. Is there any prayer requests? Before I just um, find the people. Okay.
Let's have a look. Okay, so generally we just got some people saying Shabbat Shalom to the saints. Got Suzanne, Shabbat Shalom, Suzanne, Ozan, and we've got a, um, someone from Pakistan, it seems, um, saying hello. So hello, brothers and sisters scattered abroad. Um, so, no questions, no comments? Okay. Did, as, yeah. Yeah, let me, let, me do that. let me do that at the end. Sorry. I forgot. I, I lost myself there. Um, is there any prayer requests? Okay. Well, we're going to, um, we're going to pray. I'm going to dismiss. And if anyone desires or has comments or want to, to, to testify or to anything like that, then feel free to stay, to hang around. And, you know, I'll be here. And, but if you want to, to leave and start fellowshipping, then you're free to do, to do so. Okay, let's pray. Father in heaven, we are thankful for this day, a day that you have made. And Father, we know that sometimes the word is difficult for us and for others to digest. But Father, we just ask that you, being the husbandman, that you remove any of the weeds that may choke the word, bearing fruit, you chase off any of those fowls, the birds which may try and steal the word, and you plant this seed into good fertile ground. We ask, Father, that we become a fruitful people unto you, that you will be pleased with us in well-doing, and we hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Father, we also pray and declare ourselves to be a holy people. And if there is any spot or any blemish amongst us, Father, we pray that you will cleanse us by your word, that we will be cleansed by the renewing of our minds and by your Holy Spirit, so we can move on into perfection. Perfection in your eyes. And Father, we pray in the name of Yeshua that you will create opportunities for us to share this word. For we know that it is better to give than to receive. In the name of Yeshua, any of your people who are in pain, any of your people who are going through situations, we pray that you will deliver them through diverse times, through their trials and through their tribulations, knowing that it works patience. It works faith. Help us in our times of need, especially those situations where we may be going through financial or marital problems. We just invite you into our lives and ask you to have your way. And we ask that you bless your people. Place your name upon your people. May Jehovah bless you or keep you. May Jehovah cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May Jehovah lift up his countenance upon you and give you all peace. In Yeshua's name, amen. 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 So if there is anyone who wants to hang around, they've got, they've got um, questions or they've got comments, then please do so. Feel free to do so. I know we've got questions in the back. I'm going to be available to answer questions if there is any online. But, um, yeah, feel free. You're free to eat your chicken or your, your, your salad or your, you know, your, your bread if you, you want to. Um, did you want to? Yeah, yeah, it's still recording. Come on. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat it's just, shalom. It's just something quick, really, that you mentioned if you asked 
when you asked us if anyone has actually had the experience of um, someone um, saying about um, oh crap, I forgot what you said. What did you say again about the about the um, the rejection the rejection of the, the rejection of the epistle? Yeah. yeah, I haven't, but and I have at the same time because what they tend to do is they avoid reading it or they'll look into it and they and they're dead quiet. They won't really say much about it because it, it, it flies in the face of their doctrine. Um, you know, so, so in a way I have, but, it's, but not in the way you've experienced it. Yeah. it it's, it's a mute subject. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, they just kind of keep quiet about it. But yeah, um, I kind of have seen that. So, you know, um, you can't say much to James, really. It's kind of plain. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's very plain, but yet it's an epistle people don't want to don't want to spend time looking at it's just generally Galatians Galatians and Romans but we've gone through that process and we've we've sort of addressed Galatians and Romans now I'm looking online in <coughs> yeah yeah come up by all means uh, first my comment is about James on that verse 10 that every day I found someone that the f look like the only thing that they know about James is f that verse 10 that say if you don't keep everything you you are not able to keep so just forgot yes. and and what I say to people is the words of James if you take the context what he has explained is to encourage people to perfection not to encourage people to just sit relax and leave you whatever you want because you will not ever be able to keep everything so people need to understand that what people what he's saying to 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 the congregation is if you try to keep that and you just reject the other ones you you are no better than someone that don't keep nothing so he's encouraging people to keep everything so don't try to select what you want to keep you need to to be uh, uh, to 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 do whatever you are able to to be perfect in every single commandment that Jehovah gave to us and my, my question is about what uh, James say about Abraham being justified by by works yeah. uh, I was trying to to remember here the verse where Paul say that Abraham was not justified by works you 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 remember the verse where Paul say about that um, I can try and find it and uh, my question is how we can um, conciliate Paul uh, uh, statement about that that Abraham cannot justify by by his what he did because otherwise he can like say yeah I, I, I was uh, better than other ones I, I, I'm saved because I was able to do it how to conciliate that with what uh, um, James is say that actually he's justified by work because he work work together with his faith to justify him so that's a good question. And the only sort of way you can approach that kind of question is by spending the time actually defining what the definition of works is in that context. Now, when you look at the epistle to the Galatians and the epistle to the Romans, the works that he is talking about is the works that you do whilst not believing in Yeshua. More specifically, a work of Judaism. There are people that, especially in the book of Galatians, and we looked at that, which were trying to come in, but were teaching Judaism. That work is not able to justify you. In the scenario with the the Romans, he's, he's more trying to get people's head around that it's faith, not, not whether you're a Jew, that brings justification, which is why he's, he's essentially going about um, teaching the people that there is neither Jew, nor Greek, nor Gentile. So really, the only way you can sort of teach 
when they're both seemingly saying different things is by going through the process we've gone through and defining who the epistle to is to, what's the definition of faith that they're speaking about, and what's the definition of works. Now, when you, when you look at Abraham, you can see in the account of Abraham both um, sides of that scenario. You can see that he is a man who is faithful, he believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness, but you can also see in the same account that because he believed, he was obedient. Yes. And, um, Verse 1. Yeah, and that, that's the only way, chapter 4, verse 1. What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, have found? 2. For if Abraham were justified by works, he have whereof to glory, but not before God. And this is, that's the only way you can describe it, or define it, by going through the process that we have. So many individuals will go to four, like what we've mentioned before, without going to one, chapter one, verse one. Because when you go through one, you can clearly see that the works which are being spoken about, which Paul is teaching against, isn't obedience to the law while you have faith in Yeshua. It's a works that people do despite faith in Yeshua. And Paul and, and, and James tries to bring that out. Now, going into Genesis, there are two particular passages which might give us an idea as to the angles that these people are coming from. There's Genesis 15. Verse 6, and he believed in Jehovah, and he counted it unto him for righteousness. This is what many people is often quoted. But there's another passage, which is very seldom spoken about. And I'm trying to find it. It's in Genesis 22. No, no, 22. That, the bless, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gates of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. So in one, in one scenario, the Almighty is saying, because you believed, I'm going to account it unto you for righteousness, and here is the promises, because you believed. In this account, in Genesis 22, it says, here are the promises, because you obeyed. So really, belief and obedience is the hand in the glove and it's very very difficult which is why I'm having to explain it lengthily to try and take a verse and explain that verse of Paul against the verses of James without you know going through the process and defining what's being what they're speaking about and this is how James can come at it from this angle Genesis 22 and Paul can come out of it a different. Yeah, James, uh, James uh, 26 verse 5 as well, God says the same about Abraham. Yeah. If he obeyed, uh, I am going to keep my word. And, 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 and it's even more specific to say, because he obeyed my commandments, my precepts, my statutes, yeah. my laws. So, he's, very so he's blessing Isaac because, because the dead obeyed the commandments and judgments. Did you? You had your hand up. Oh, yeah. Um, 
Can you just come and... So, Shema Shalom. Um, so, I've been basically trying to have, like, a dialogue with someone um, who's been, like, an evangelist for, like, years and years. And um, basically, it's like, he, he doesn't seem to understand that there's a difference between, like, lifestyle choice and salvation. And so, like, he, 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 he just recently quoted a verse from Ephesians. Um, it's Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9. And um, so, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not as a result of works, that no one may boast. So, when I try and explain to him that basically it's not about boasting, like it's not about like who's the best at keeping Torah, like who's it, who, like it's not about that. It's actually about like a lifestyle. It's like they don't understand. Like they think it's like um, they think that Yeshua brought his like a new law. And it's like they think that Yeshua, like that Yeshua's law of liberty is what they need to follow. But like they don't, it's like reconciling like the Sermon of the Mount with the Torah. Like they can't, they just can't do that. So yeah, no, I just thought I'd make a comment. Um, okay. And yeah. All I, all I would say to certain individuals is to read the rest of the passage because it's e like like with anything, it's easy to go and, you know, just cut and paste. But if you don't read the rest, this is what it says. For by grace, and we did, we covered this in the For by Grace Are Ye Saved series. But here is what it says. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's where people stop, but the, the, the book doesn't stop there for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in him so the Christian that's not what they're going to quote you but if you if you have a highlighter pen I would highlight the first verse and then the second because that, that thought has not finished at verse number eight. It carries on. So you're not saved by works. It's not the works that saves you. It's the grace through faith. Not that you can boast. And the works that was prevalent at the time was the works of Judaism. People did not exercise faith. What they were exercising was their works. They were keeping commandments statutes and judgments but they weren't necessarily the commandments statutes and judgments which told the people to wait on Yeshua they was doing all kinds of works but it tells you you're not saved by works you're saved by faith the faith in Yeshua but because your faith you're saved you are created to do good works just like the children of Israel they're delivered from the household of bondage and then they're given instructions to live by so they can remain free. That is a good example as to what Father does when he, he saves a person or an individual, then gives them his word so they can remain saved. And he sends and gives you his spirit so you can walk in that salvation, in that being saved. So we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Yeah. The works as defined by who? Um, I, I, if I understand this correctly, James is, James is referring to, in some of the, in some of the text, to the works of the Jews in Judaism. James. No, I, 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 Ephesians. Um, yes, yeah, so if I'm, I'm reading Ephesians right now, and that, that epistle 
the epistle to the Ephesians or the people of Ephesia is contrasting and you, you'll get the context if you just carry on reading because then it talks about wherefore remember that ye being in times past Gentiles in the flesh who were called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. So the context if you carry on reading, he's, he's, he's making the comparison between the circumcision, and the, which is the Jews in the flesh, and the uncircumcision. So when we're talking about the works, we're talking about works that people are doing whilst rejecting Yeshua, which is Judaism. But there is some works that you should do when you receive Yeshua which is live walking out your faith and you only amen. amen you can't you can't see that if you just open this one verse kind of no you can only see that if you're trying to because remember these people never wrote the bible verse chapter they wrote letters they wrote scriptures as they were inspired Hallelujah. Does that make sense? Amen. Good. Is there any other questions before we close? Or comments? Or prayer requests? Okay. Well, I am, I am glad. I'm glad to be here. I pray that you all have a wonderful remaining of your Shabbat. And yeah, just another quick point. Um, on, on here, on here, there is a little box which deals with gift aid. Now, what we recently did is we dealt with our gift aid and it, it equaled to a good few months rent if we were to stay here. It turned out to be like quite a, a sizable amount of money. Yet at the same time, it was less than half of the people's support that goes in here. Does that make sense? So all we're asking, okay, this box, if you tick it, it means that the government will support, will give an additional 25% if that's ticked. Now, when we went to deal with the government, to receive that 25%, it worked out to be just under a thousand pound for the period that we did this. But it was only less than half of the donations, tithes and offerings that people support us with. Does that make sense? That's what I'm saying. So please, if you know, if you're filling it out, just give it a tick and um, it supports us. Shabbat Shalom.